My name is... That's a long story. A story which took 20 years to live out. And it's taken dozens of interviews with cops and lawyers and three days of testimony on the witness stand and countless conversations with therapists and counselors and advocates to tell. Some of the worst parts of the story played itself out in front of people. Friends, family members, co-workers, strangers. People who turned a blind eye or a deaf ear. Or a cold heart, maybe. People who had their own problems to deal with who didn't want to get involved in someone else's family problem. A private problem which should never rear its ugly head where nice people might have it forced to their consciousness. And make them feel what? Confused? Horrified? Annoyed? Conflicted about what to do or about what not to do? Why didn't you just leave? A lot of them have asked a few of them vocally, but most were just the way they looked at me or didn't look at me. The experts say the average domestic violence victim tries to leave seven times before the situation resolves itself with either a successful escape or death. Mine ended with the sixth try, I think. Maybe I'm just a fast learner, huh? Nowadays, they all tell me how proud of them they are. How proud they are of all three of us. But where were they then? I didn't even know my own name. My name is Jean. I was her older sister until I passed away a few years ago. But I still want to help you tell the story. I mean, what else do I have to do, right? I don't really know how she hooked up with a guy like that. We weren't raised that way. Her father never even lifted his voice at Mama or us kids, much less his hand. He was much too busy working three jobs, six days a week, so Mama could stay home and raise us the right way. And she did. Now, when my sister was younger, she had a few boyfriends, you know, just like all of us did. She loved dancing and cruising King and Story in her badass 78 Regal, but she had worked ever since she was six. She loved dancing and cruising King and Story in her badass 78 Regal. And she, she graduated high school, and she had worked ever since she was 16, and she minded her own business. And the boys, they were all pretty respectful to her, you know? Okay, except for that guy that got her pregnant and then was out of the picture, at least until the last couple of years. I think that had something to do with that asshole who's in prison. Some of a friend of a friend. Nobody needs friends like that. How I fell in love with a prison convict serving three years for a crime he didn't commit, I still don't really know. Sure, I was young and alone and pregnant. I guess I was just vulnerable what they do, you know. They find the vulnerable ones. You've seen the wildlife show where the lion finds the lamest zebra in the herd of thousands and zeroes in and stalks it and devours it. That was us. I was his lame zebra. What I do know is something about his letters made me feel special. Special enough to visit him in prison. Special enough to believe the stories of his innocence. Special enough to believe the grandiose ideas what he was going to do when he got out. Him. A ninth grade dropout with no special skills other than dealing small amounts of cocaine and talking really, really big. Oh, and tattooing. Sure do that. Oh, and making bombs and setting them off in cars. My name is, well, I'm not going to tell you what it is now, because I changed it a long time ago to hide from him, and I don't care what's happened after that. He knew me as Monica, so let's go with that. I hadn't even thought about him for years until some detective wandered through my old neighborhood and asked me if I knew Monica. I said, why? What's it about? And he said it was about him. 
I said, who did he kill? Because I wouldn't be surprised he almost killed me. I often prayed he would. When a 14-year-old girl gets a crush on a big, talking, older guy, bad things can happen. Like being locked in his house for three years. That's right, three years. A virtual dungeon where a whole lot of things happen that I don't ever want to think or speak about ever again. Until, on the eve of my 18th birthday, I told him if he let me go, I'd grab my money from my piggy bank and my stuff and we could legally get married. Yeah, it was bullcrap, but he wasn't the brightest crayon, you know. He dropped me off at my parents' house, and when I got there, I ran in the front door and out the back. My parents hid me from him far, far away, and for months, he stalked my parents' house, looking for me, begging for me, professing his love for me, until he finally blew up my parents' car in their driveway. He did a few years for the bomb, and I tried to tell the cops back then about what he did to me, but they didn't care. They didn't want to listen. I told the detective that I wasn't going to testify about what happened to me to help her case. She made her bed. I did tell him, however, to look for <coughs> Susan, if she's still alive. We got married when he was in the joint, and when he got out, he raised my older daughter as his own. Yeah, right. It, the violence, started right away, when he didn't like my friends, or the way I talked to them, or the way I dressed. But he always apologized and promised it wouldn't happen again, and sometimes there were flowers and nice dinners, and I just <coughs> figured he was getting used to life on the outside. I ignored the red flags when he moved us way out to the boondocks to a little ranch where no one, especially my friends and family, could come over and bother us in our idyllic life together. And I ignored the red flags when the apologies and promises and flowers and dinners turned into just blaming me. I worked at a church the whole time. For a while he had a job too. He would come home on the weekend after working out of town for the week. Two days of hell and five days of waiting for hell to return. Which is worse in a way, the waiting I mean. He worked until he couldn't hold a steady job anymore. He said, he said it was because I was so beautiful and hot and sexy and that he loved me so much that he was afraid that someone might try to take me away from him. He just got so nervous and anxious when we were apart that he just couldn't hold a job. <clears throat> My name is Kim, and I used to work with her at the church. For the longest time, she seemed so happy and carefree. I mean, I watched her girls grow up, and I loved them to death, but after a while, things started to get, I don't know, kind of tense. I mean, she was always having to call him the second she arrived to work, and then the last second before she left, and he kept calling her all throughout the day. And it was kind of obsessive, I guess. And looking back, I should have made something of it. But she always said everything was fine. And she never complained or really confided in me. And we were friends, so I guess... I don't know. I just wish she had said something. I mean, how could I help her if she didn't say anything? And I met him once before all the craziness started happening. And he seemed okay. I mean, he was charming in a rough and tumble sort of way, except the way he used to talk about their love life in real graphic terms. And the way he used to talk about his farm animals having sex was very creepy. I mean, I was raised on a farm in the Midwest, so I know all about that. But when he described to me one time about how two of his pigs did it? I don't know, it was just so wrong. And then her little bumps and bruises started getting worse and more frequent. And they both said it was because she was getting drunk and falling down, but boy, I didn't really believe it. But yet she never said anything. 
So. He became suspicious when I suddenly wasn't so keen on satisfying his carnal desires three or four times a day. Every single day. You see, his love for me was so great that he just had to know all the time how much I loved him. He had to make sure that I loved him more than I loved any other man in my life. Because endlessly, excruciatingly, on my romantic past, all my past boyfriends before I had even met him. Every word spoken, every kiss stolen, every awkward teenage grope, and every lustful adult moment. The exact who, what, when, where, and how. How long did it last? How big was he? Especially that. No, no, not bigger than you. Which positions exactly? And of course, I couldn't remember every single detail when I contradicted myself on a tiny detail the tenth time I told it to him. Oh, I paid the price for my bad memory. My name is Megan, although all they ever called me was juror number eight. When they told me during the voir dire what this trial was all about, I didn't really believe it. I swore to hear the evidence and to make a decision based on that, but it sounded... It sounded so unreal. It was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. I'd been divorced twice from a couple of jerks, but there was never any violence or this kind of psychotic um, control. My first thoughts when hearing the vague outline of the case was, why didn't she leave? If it was really like this, why didn't she just leave? During the trial, she talked about the notebooks, but it wasn't until we saw them displayed on a screen, page by page by page by page, three full handwritten notebooks with so many intimate details from before the time he even met her, and then, I mean, all his handwritten notes about them, and detailed flowcharts, and I don't know what else. And then the lie detector tests, three of them all with explicit questions, and I just wondered, why would she do these things? How could he possibly get her to do these things? Why didn't she leave? And then most of all, why the hell did she ever tell him about the affair? I don't know why I agreed to the polygraphs. I'd already written down all the details for him three times. Each time he took the book away, he had me write it out again and again. So hard to remember everything. I tried, I really tried with each inconsistency. I paid the price for my imperfect memory. So then he insisted on the lie detector text. He spent weeks formulating the questions. We went to a lot of different PIs until he found one disreputable enough to ask me all his long, rambling, obscene questions. When I didn't completely fail the test, he was convinced it was because I was giving sexual favors to the examiner. So he beat me. He couldn't help himself. The violence was my fault. And I caused it by either failing certain questions I should have passed, or by passing certain ones I should have failed. I never really knew which was which. Then came the final test. He's going to have the examiner ask me if I had ever cheated on him. Somehow this was Never in the mix before, he was so sure I hadn't. I mean, why would I settle for second best? But he just had to make sure to help him deal with his increasing anxiety because he loved me so much. When I agreed to that test, agreed being a relative term because one would always eventually agree, I figured that answering falsely and being found a liar was worse than just telling the truth. I think I was wrong. You see, I had cheated on him for six years. The man wanted my love and my body, but didn't insist on taking my soul with it. So I admitted it. Not until things really got bad and my older daughter moved out and joined the army because Iraq or Afghanistan was much safer. My name is, well, that's a long story. Not as long as my mom's, but my stories lasted all of my life. 
You see, when I was born, I was given the name Danielle, but I never knew my real father, so he raised me and changed my name, but now I'm Danielle again. Anyways, they say time heals everything. That's such a tired cliche. In my experience, it deadens the pain a little, but also creates some inconvenient moments when memories get triggered. It's funny, I forget what I did yesterday, but I remember everything he did all those years ago. Because of him, I grew up believing I was unlovable and stupid and useless. I knew from the beginning what he had with my mom was not normal. My nights were haunted by her screams and the thumping sounds of objects he used to hit her with. Sometimes I took the beatings for her, but it was scary that I was somehow glad to do it. And then it brought him some sort of pleasure. I think I was 12 when he told me he'd kill me and bury me in the mountains and that nobody would miss me. I'll never forget the look of darkness in his eyes when he said that. Somehow, I managed to find someone just like him, narcissistic, abusive, and full of shit. The first time my boyfriend in the army hit me, I was enraged. I fought back with everything I had. Finally, I realized when I was fighting back, I was actually fighting him. I've lived with this pain for so long, I don't know how to let it all go. But I will. I have to. I pray that God takes mercy on his soul, but if he doesn't, I'm okay with that too. My hope is that time will somehow free my soul from the darkness and from him. After he found out about the affair, he went to work with me every day, every single day, and stayed with me in my office. He watched me and followed me and timed my bathroom breaks. He helped explain away an increasing number of bumps and bruises and scrapes to my coworkers. You see, I was just a clumsy person who drank a lot and fell down a lot, which was true, somewhat. <laughs> How else does a person deal with him except for the mind and body-numbing booze? He told him I got scraped up by doing a lot of hard work on our ranch, which I did do, mostly all of it now, as penance for my sins. Feed and muck and stack and repair. Let me write the emails to my coworkers, explaining to them how I was not the person I, they thought I was. How I was a cheater and a liar. I would never again be known by my childhood nickname, the name they all knew me by, Annie. Because Annie was a whore, and Annie was dead now. I would only be known by my birth name or by my new nickname, Whore. They helped me explain to my coworkers the strange tattoos I was getting. My name is Christian, and I didn't know them really well, because I had just started working with a thrift shop at the church a year or so before before all hell broke loose. I remember when she sent the email, the one about changing her name, and about having an affair, and right about that time, he was always at the church. He didn't even work there. He was always just hanging around her office. And while he was there, he, he, she would tell random callers that she was a whore. Weird. But the weirdest things of all were the tattoos. Now, he was a tattoo artist. He said, and she already had a lot of tattoos, but she always kept them covered up. That is until adulteress, right in the middle of her forehead, appeared. She would try to comb her hair over it, but he would always make her comb it back. And the one after that? I mean, who has a whore tattooed on their neck with flowers around it? I mean, she, I guess she wanted them, because that's what he always said to me. To people. He would always say, look at what she made me do because she felt so guilty. I had to do it. She begged me to. And she would just nod or say nothing except, this is my cross to bear. So I guess she did want them? I don't know. You ever hear of that French phrase, well I do? Yeah. I think maybe both of them were crazy. I 
thought the tattoos would be the end of it. Prayed they were because this camel's back couldn't carry any more straw. For months, he made threats that I would either let him do those final two tattoos, or he would drug me and tie me down and do even worse ones. So eventually I agreed, thinking no, praying that somehow, maybe, it would be enough. While it satisfied him, enough so that the bruises could be hidden by clothing and the black eyes could be lightened by a lot of makeup, it was still so hard on him. I had hurt him too much. There's new random notebooks about the affair, and his revenge plots kept his twisted little brain active for a time. He had rigged a tiny camera and hidden it in a little birdhouse. He wanted me to lure my ex-lover to my office and seduce him, and he instructed me where to put the birdhouse, which physician to have sex in, so that he could get photographic proof of his own size. Yeah, that was his plan. But I managed to put him off on that one, because it only ended up really badly. So instead, he made me find an artist who would draw, well, let's just say that those drawings are probably the only comic relief of the trial. My name is Gilsa. I am an artist. I do portraits and still lifes and pencil or ink in my studio. I have been a professional artist for over 50 years. Uh, when the police detective brought me a pair of sketches all rolled up, he said he wanted to show me something and see if it was my work. I said I always sign my work, so it should be easy. But when he unrolled them, I recognized them immediately and remembered why I did not sign them. They were two drawings of a... <laughs> well, in Shaman we say Schwanz. One was I, Kleiner Schwanz. And the other was Ein Bell Gross Schwanz. <laughs> I remember clearly she had called me up and asked me about doing these two slides. And I said to her, not be slide models. I use light models for faces and even whole nudes, but not this. <laughs> and then she said it was only from a verbal description, and I still said no. It sounded so veracht. I mean, crazy. But she was very serious, and she said it might be the only scene that saves her marriage all her life. She was almost crying, so I agreed. Then, when he came with her to the studio, he insisted on sitting right next to me while I drew. And I said, no, I can't work that way. So he sat across the room, but he strained to hear and see everything. <laughs> I could tell which one he wanted me to believe was his. What my suspicion? Unser. Or how you say in English? Insecurity. <laughs> he was suffering so much inside, he still couldn't let it go. His new plan. I had to sacrifice three things for my sins. Then it would be enough. Just three things. A foot, my face, and a finger. That's all. Then I would be forgiven and he could love me again. He told me this every day, dozens of times a day, over and over for weeks. You owe me three things. And finally, one day he called me over and said, you stand right there. I did. Don't move. I didn't. He beat my foot with a hammer until the bones cracked and the tears streamed, but no cries came out. I would not let them. You still owe me two. Day after day, you still owe me two. And finally, one day, he said, you stand right there. I did. Don't move. I didn't. He held a red hot metal spatula against my cheek until the sizzling flesh stunk and my salty tears streamed and stung the seeping wounds, but no cries came out. I would not let them. 
You still owe me one. The next day, nothing but the words. You still owe me one and the next and the next. Till one Jack and Coke Bill night, I could not take it anymore. So finally, I told him, you stand right there. He did. Don't move. He didn't. I went to the kitchen, and with my right hand, I picked up the biggest, sharpest butcher knife I could find. His knife. My name's Elaine. I was a prosecutor in the case. In my 20 years in the DA's office, I had done dozens and dozens of jury trials, uh, mostly domestic violence and more than a few murders. But there had probably never been a more dramatic moment in any of my years than when, at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon, while at the witness stand, she told the jury in gory, vivid detail about what happened in the kitchen with the knife. The judge adjourned the trial for the day and the jury had all weekend to keep that image and that story in their minds. When they came back the next week, they saw the photos. And they heard from Susan, one of his other past victims, whose story was very similar to Monica's. But unlike Monica, who disappeared again right before the trial, Susan agreed to testify. And then the coup de grace was the younger daughter's diary, written when she was just nine years old. Dear Diary, it's the Linda again. Today is not a good day. My mommy has a lot of bruises and my dad keeps kicking and hitting her. It made me so scared I could not even eat. It made my stomach hurt. It hurts now. He says, if he ever catches her lying to him again, he will do stuff to her that he can't even imagine. My dad got a pink kitchen knife and knocked it to the floor. He said, do you know what I use this for? She said, for cutting meat. And he said, I'll show you what I use this for. And he almost stabbed her. Right now, my mom has a lot of bruises on her butt, on her thighs, on her stomach, and on her arm. I'm scared, God, please do not let her lie to him again. I don't want him to get hurt. I went to my room to get away from them. I can't find Pooh Bear. I left him on the bed, but he's not there now. I love Pooh Bear. I wish he was here. I'm scared, God. I'm scared. told him, you stand right there. He did. Don't move. He did. I went to the kitchen and with my right hand, I picked up the biggest, sharpest butcher knife I could find. His knife. put my left hand down on the table, and I brought the blade down as hard as I could. He came running in, I screamed, here's your finger, now what are you going to do to me? And I cried, and I cried, and I cried out loud at last. It got better for a little while. He was so proud of me. I'd proven my love for him. But it couldn't last Not with him. I had hurt him too much. So it continued. So finally, 
on July 29th, 2007, after five unsuccessful attempts to leave him throughout the years, including attempts made with my car, and with pills, and even with a gun and handcuffs once. We made our escape from him, with the help of two angels. The cops caught him, and Elaine tried him, and the judge locked him up for 45 to life. He'll be eligible for parole when he's 85. If I can ever stop looking over my shoulder before that day, I will surely start all over again if he's ever free. Certain tattoos are gone, but the scars remain. Will they get lighter, little by little? It's been ten whole years since we made our escape from him. I'm still trying to make my escape for myself as I was with him. I'm still trying to find my real self, the self I was before, the self I long to be again. My name is... It's a long story.